Is Beth Levin there? Hi, yeah, this is Beth. Beth, you're on the podcast, Journey of an Esthete. Oh, hi. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, say a little blurb up front, if you don't mind, which I always do um, for our guests. And I, I, you know, I have all sorts of guests on my show. Mm -hmm. uh, and of all, not only all sorts of art mediums, but styles, but also um, of accomplishment. But I have to say, of all the guests we've had, um, you are among the most remarkable. And I'm a little bit nervous, I must say. So, uh, oh, uh, Beth, no, Beth, don't be. Well, well, Beth Levin is, a, is, a, is, a, is what they used to call a world-class pianist. Oh, thank and, you. And not only one of the nation and the world's top pianists, but a living uh, connection to the traditions of classical concert piano. Uh, she has excelled both in chamber music as well as solo performance. She studied with uh, some of the, well, you have a, a link to uh, Beethoven, of course, because you studied with both Rudolf Serkin and Leonard Schur. Mm -hmm. And you hail originally from Philadelphia, I believe, right? Yes, yes. Um, I'm so excited to have a pianist. I'm speaking as a pianist myself. A pianist of your caliber on this show is a real treat. And so... Oh, thank you. I don't really know where to begin. Typically on our show, we, we do a little, what I like to call a linear chronology, which is sort of a fancy uh -huh. way of saying personal bio biography. Uh -huh. Under the... Uh, under the supposition that, you know, the good non-linear linear stuff will start to happen if we start with mm -hmm. the framework. So uh, tell us how you became uh, the pianist that you are a little bit. And, and of course, we should also mention that you're, you're, you're a, a poet. Uh, we can get to that a little bit later, if you don't mind, maybe even read some poetry. <laughs> That's up to okay. you. But, um, <laughs> but what, uh, uh, tell us about your, uh, how, you know, how you came, came to be uh, the musician you are. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I mean, when I was very young, and I mean, like, <laughs> age three, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, we had this very large piano in the basement. It was an upright. It was just an old, big, big sound, you know, and I'd go down there and just it was sort of, it just became like my my little place to be um and uh I don't know what I just started playing and then luckily we had a lot of music in the bench and so just very naturally I just started to read it and you know so uh, it was a very natural just going to the piano you know and That's then and yeah, and it was just, it was really fun for, it was just fun for a long, for a long time, you know, but then um, I guess, you know, I had a teacher in the, in the neighborhood and she wrote to my mother and she said, oh, you know, we have to find her a, a, a teacher now, a, a really serious teacher, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and we went to Marianne Salar, who was, a great, great pianist. He had come over from um, Poland, mm -hmm. and uh, he was just, a, you know, a phenomenal teacher. I was so lucky with teachers. I mean, Pilar and then Sirkin after that, and Leonard Shore. I mean, I, and uh, do you mind yeah. if I interject and slow you down just a little bit because these names are important? Sure. Of course, I know Sirkin uh, because of like like yourself. Uh, one of the, I, I think of the interpreters of Beethoven, the best, yeah. of course, is yourself, yeah. Schnabel, Brendel, and Beth Levin. Yeah. In that. But, <laughs> but I just want to slow you down just a little bit, because what period of time sure. are we talking? And also, um, it's interesting, are you, what, are you, would you fit the designation of a child prodigy? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think, you know, when I talk to friends who are, uh, musicians, everybody's got a, a similar story of uh, starting very young. You know, just it just happens that way. I think it, in a lot of cases. It's but I don't reason, know. The only reason why I ask is that I'm, in my biography is in many respects the opposite of yours because I had no access for a very long time. Mm, yeah. To yeah. musical instruments. So I oh. piano very late. So not at three, yeah. more like eight. 
And so yeah, my, yeah. my total entree into the world of good music was, was through recordings and records. Now, of yeah. course, you know, as a toddler, I was drawn to good music, and, you know, luck, luckily was obsessed with listening to, you know, music. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I thought these things, you know, are interesting people's biographies of when they, but you had access to this great instrument. And so I just wanted to slow you down a little bit because it was the first name you mentioned was interesting. Um, your first teacher, you really. Yeah. This would have been yeah, he, the 60s, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, in the sixties, he, you know, he had been sadly in the Holocaust. He had been in many oh, wow. camps. Yeah, I mean, his whole career was disrupted. But then, uh, after the war, he went to, uh, of all people, Gisa King. He just like knocked oh. on Gisa King. He knocked on his door. And Gisa King took him in and, and taught him free of charge. For, you're talking about Walter? So, you're talking about yeah, Walter? Yeah, yeah, so you're Walter saying, you're saying this dude just went to get some <laughs> yeah. So that's the yeah. way things were then. You can knock on the door of Walter Gisa King. Well, apparently Gisa King wasn't so happy. He said uh -huh. to him, why, why didn't you write me? You know, why didn't uh -huh. you just show up? <laughs> and I think uh, Marion Falar said, you know, I've just been, I, you know, I had this terrible history in the camps and mm. I wanted to come and play for you if you would just let me play for you, you know. Mm. And that, that did turn him around and because, well, for Lars, for instance, his, his Chopin was, was just incredible, oh, wow. you know. And um, so he took him in and then uh, he wound up coming to America, which turned out to be just very, very lucky for us. Sure. Meaning his his students, you know, we were like, oh, you know, so lucky to have a teacher like that. And he did play in America, but I think he wound up teaching more and also adjudicating quite a bit, like in the Chopin competition and things like that. Uh, but there's a there's a great, you know, you can find some recordings of him now, which is just so great. Well, I think, and, uh, he, he, yeah. and, and, you know, when, when we do our uh, episodes, we always have a lot of colorful artwork and we always have it inside the episode. So maybe mm -hmm. if you don't mind, we can include a mention of, uh, you know, anything that, <gasps> oh, yeah. if that's oh, yeah. Thing, I, you know, of course. Oh, yeah, I, I can, I'll try to just mail you, say, like, this wonderful article about him that includes uh, some uh, playing. And so, so would it be fair to say that you first studied Chopin with him? Yes, and yes, so definitely. What pieces did you did you tackle? Did, what was your oh yeah your introduction he, to Chopin? Talk about it. Oh uh, yeah, he gave us. I think he gave us just sort of like every, a little of everything, like the waltzes, the mazurkas, polonaise. Oh, uh, wow. Not nothing like the concerti until much later. All the shorter shorter works uh, as a child. Well, I was 13, yeah. Well, those those shorter works, in my view, are among the greatest works ever written for the piano. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, right. I, mean, I rank, so the mazurkas, yeah. I mean, talk about the, uh, the harmonic, they're very advanced harmonically. I mean... Oh, no, I'll listen to what you have to say about that. Honestly, oh, my goodness. It's too, um, it's, it's just sort of, I I totally agree with you that they're some of the greatest things ever written. So what is it like being 12, 13 and, and, a, and playing this music for the first time? And, and that, <laughs> oh my what God. Your, yeah. What was it? Just talk about the experience and if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, you know, I would walk in and I'll tell you, I started, I think at that point, to realize I had I had a voice at the piano that was a very you know almost like a a, a bolt of acknowledgement for my for my um for my progress but then so I'd come in you know and I'd play yeah. and then let uh, and then um Marianne Solar would sit down and he would play the exact same piece and you would just like it would, you know, you would just learn so much just just from that, just from listening. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. 
Uh, for one thing, he had the most incredible tone. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm happy to hear you say that because one of the, uh, in, to my humble opinion, one of your greatest virtues as a pianist is your tone production. Oh my goodness! Is, well, well, if you whole, say that, which is sure. out of this world, and you know, I'm not oh, I'm really so I recommend very much the listeners go out and get recordings of F11 if you want to want to hear tone, but. Talk a little bit about that, because that was something that yeah. must have inspired I mean, you. Must oh, my God. I mean, I think anyone who heard, I guess in a, in a funny way, that's a lot of how I learned from any teacher, you know, because his tone was, you know, beyond it just being singing, a singing tone, which it was. Mm-hmm. It was, oh, you know, it went so deep and it was so human and oh. uh, very at the same time, very elegant. He never was overly emotive. He kind of had a great elegance about him. Uh, so, I mean, I, I sort of, I think you could say I drank it in. I, oh, yeah. I, I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, this is happening. I mean, I just, yeah. it just happened. You know, anybody who studied with him, I think, would feel that way, that you would just get it if, Partly osmosis, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was under the impression initially that 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 aspect of your your playing uh, came from from Sirkin, but I'm sure you got things from Sirkin. We can come to that later. But but this is right. uh, this is really something. Hearing how um well the power the power of a good teacher is interesting, right? Like a yeah. Um, uh, so you, I guess you're you're entering competitions, or what is happening? You're playing Chopin, and you're playing. Talk about oh, your, well, your journey there with that. Um, let's see. Well, with uh, I was going to say, yeah, when you were talking about great teaching, he, I think we were sort of his children. You know, he didn't oh, wow. have he didn't have children, and yeah. we became so. It, we meant a lot to him, and he would he would spend like an hour writing out fingering and things like that. Oh, wow! So you automatically. What became like I became such a good uh, sight reader because I think originally because of the knowing fingering so well from him and F- knowing so, fingering you know fingering is so important isn't it I mean <laughs> the white fingering, yes, I mean, yes. if, like you know my music is almost right. entirely improvised and composed it's it's original yeah, music yeah but I got to tell you that the fingering has is always has to be the right fingering all the time consistent. If you don't have that fingering, then nothing else can happen in a way. It's interesting. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Yeah, sometimes it's a very little technical thing that does make all the difference. Yeah. Um, but I, I was going to say that he prepared me so well that, like, for instance, I played a concerto um, with the Philadelphia Orchestra as a young. Oh, which one? Let's see. Uh, C minor of uh, Beethoven. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he prepared me so well. And then also, then when I went to audition for Sirkin, I was just prepared to the end. You know, I I almost don't even want to take credit for it. I mean, I was just so prepared. I walked in, and that was it. You know, you just were accepted. It was very, uh, it was kind of a magical time for me at that point, you know. Circuit and then and then even sure too. But, um, do you mind me asking you just what comes to your consciousness when I mention when you think of Circuit, your first time meeting <laughs> him, or what? I mean, yeah. Laugh, but I mean he's a, I mean he in a way he's a spiritual link to Beethoven, right? In many ways. Yeah. Would you very that? very much? I mean he would he would kind of gossip about. Uh, Clara Schumann, you know, he he would just talk about all these people as if he really knew them and understood, you know, our our, our whole musical history. Uh, But again, I think I got so much from him just by listening, really. Uh, He didn't actually, in my lessons, he didn't say that much. It was more um, kind of playing and You'd play and he'd go, oh, he'd take the score and he'd go, oh, oh, that you've got to look at that again, you know, right. or that was very good or, or go home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I knew him at, at, I went to Marlboro as well for chamber music oh, and he was, was the, the, for the, head, the head of that. 
Margo at that it still is one of the top places for chamber yeah. music, serious chamber. Oh, music. it was just yeah. life changing going there. Oh my God! I mean, I, I I think I've told you. I think of myself basically as a chamber musician, yes. and and yes. that's probably the reason that you know just studying there and um, his. Uh, Spirit kind of imbued the entire summers, you know, mm. there as well. Beth, yeah. have you had the opportunity to play Messian's Quartet for the end of time? Oh, yeah, I can send you the recording. I mean, one of the recordings. The only reason why I ask about that is because you're, of course, your first teacher in the show on the Holocaust. And, and, um, and I love Right, to hear your, right, yeah. I love to hear also, your reflections when you first encountered that work, when you played that. Just to name. Oh my God! It was actually at Marlboro the first time. Oh wow! Every, every time I've ever played that piece, I it's just it's a real spiritual ex- experience. And then, the, I think the way the uh, audience responds to that piece yeah. is very often very very special as well. You know, the the whole thing is it's kind of. Uh, you kind of enter it, you know, and, and live through it. I, I, have, but, I have the opportunity yeah. to meet Messian at NEC. Oh, oh how and nice. I had the opportunity to watch him rehearse that work for four hours. Oh, I oh my oh, God. Many, yeah, that's a whole other, oh. that's a whole other. Did you ever get to meet Messian? Or? No, no, but, you know, it's funny. I think he, he did come to to Boston University when I studied with Leonard Schur and I did see him uh, there, but I never, I never sat through a rehearsal or anything. That, that sounds very exciting. It was because I mean, you, you know, it's, um, I had a lot of great experiences in, in NEC. So you went to be, mm-hmm. you went to be yeah. as well as Curtis, right? Right. After Curtis, I was sort of, Someone actually, I think, just told me that Leonard Schur had come up from Texas to now teach at Boston University. And what was good with that was that, you know, the president was giving him a lot of scholarship money and everything. So I went to um, audition and it wound up being, you know, very, very feasible to do it. So I did. I, I went to study with him. He was another one where I, I like I knocked on the door and uh, it was door, yeah. and he said, Oh my goodness, you look just like my daughter. Well that's good. That's <laughs> that was a nice opening, you know. Yeah. So and with Mr. Falar, uh, we found that we wound up having the same birthday. Really? So there were all these funny little, you know, kind of strange things that happened <laughs> but what, um, what was what was Shure's contribution to piano what was what was if I may ask as a teacher as a musician what was his what you say you yeah. got from um, well, was, he oh my god well he was the, almost the, I think of him as like a lot of the uh, similar similar to Sirkin in some ways they but also completely different um, in that, um, well, he was at one point Schnabel's uh, assistant, oh, wow. Leonard Schur. And he, again, you were immersed in Schubert, Beethoven, right. some Chopin. And, and he, you could bring him a modern work, but he wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't his that real was thing. Yeah. You know, but you, oh, we did Berg. I, I'm pretty sure I played Berg for him. You did the Berg sonata. Uh, yeah, yeah. May I ask, and, have you done the Copeland yeah. Sonata? No, I, I wish I could say I had. No, no, I haven't. I I don't know. I don't even think I have a huge repertoire. I really don't. There's some pieces where I think, oh, I'm so glad somebody else is playing. No, I, I, only, I only ask, of course, because the one that pianists tend to like is the Variations by Copeland. Mm-hmm. Right, the one that right, tend to do. right. I always feel that Sonata is his greatest work. Um Hmm. Just my own Maybe I'll career. look at it tomorrow. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering. <laughs> of course, you know, sometimes sometimes the individual musician, like Leo Smith, right, was the I think the pianist. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. That the about yes yes. And maybe David but, Tudor, well, but you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh yes, yes, David. Sure. I I I really just know these people more by name than know yeah. their work intimately. 
but um but I, I, thinking about Leonard Shore, yeah. he was he was absolutely remarkable. I mean, he could play something, and you would almost see the structure right in front of you. I mean, he was so brainy, and yet at the same time, big-hearted and mm. big sound and romantic. So it was kind of like. A, a, a wonderful mix of qualities in a pianist, mm -hmm. but mainly he had a, the thing driving him really was, I think how he understood the work, like, no, like nobody else really. Interesting. Cause I actually, in preparation for your episode, I actually reread, this shows you the kind of mind I have. I reread half of the classical style by Charles Rosen. Oh my God. Late at four in the morning, three in the morning, just to, because I have it. I have a first edition from the, 70s, and I just really fell in love rereading this. I don't know uh -huh. what, what possessed me to read it. I think there's a lot of, <laughs> about Beethoven in there. In yeah, for your yeah. episodes. Yeah, I like to prepare for for the episode. So, but uh, uh, Rosen talks a lot about how um, the classical style, um, how it blends the intellectual and the romantic, or the rigorous and the uh, yeah. uh, rigor and the emotion. Is that yeah. what you say? Does that can you relate to that? Um, formulation. Yeah, I mean, oh boy, it's tricky in that I think it's hard sometimes when you've heard all of the romantic music, mm -hmm. you know, and you've, and you've lived with it, and then you go to Beethoven or Mozart even, and to, in a way, you have, you have to rein yourself in a bit from yeah. what yeah. you've heard, you know, what you've seen happen already, and, you know, you have to kind of pull it back. I mean, uh, although I, I, say, no. I gotta say, I was blown away by your Goldberg variations. I'm thinking, you know, this is... Really? Oh my goodness. Yeah, thank so you. Thank you. A lot of people, I don't think that everyone likes it. It's because well, there's a case too where I, I, there's, there's romanticism in the box, you know, that I That's what's played. great about it. So here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. This is, I'm a, that's party that, so my favorite, of course, my favorite Goldberg was the second one by Gould, the 70s one, or 8, 1981. Right, right. Much better mm -hmm. than the 50s because I felt oh. like Gould was finally, I don't know, letting go or kind of mm. get it to another place, which I, yeah. I know yeah. a purist wouldn't agree with, right? There are purists out there like uh, yeah. like yeah. Christopher. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I'm sure you've encountered sort of sort of a Baroque specialist. Sure. But, but I... Sure. Um, but putting those those kind of silly debates aside, or, or not so silly, um, I love the feeling in your Goldberg variations, and I felt it was actually quite similar to what Gould was doing in '81, and it was a, mm. it was a kind of fearlessness about it. Oh, thank love, you, but, thank you. But you're saying that when you do that with Bach, it's still controversial, or it's not considered? Is there still a lot of them? Oh yeah, I I I I mean, I sort of had to do what I had to do because. I play, you know, I, I never think about these things, like how is it going to be received or something. Of course, of course. But but later you have to admit that people don't like, you know, when you um, maybe expand on, on Bach. Yeah, or you <laughs> or something. I don't know. I, it's hard to describe. I don't know. I mean... I, it, well, part of me was, oh, just like I, I gave, the, it's just a live performance, you know, oh, and I God. thought to myself, this performance is pretty good. Maybe I'll release it. And I, and I did, I decided to release it on a label, you know, and then after that, I did record more and more after that. Yeah. So you're saying that's one of your earlier, earlier. Um, the first, the first recording. Oh, yeah. So Bach, you started with Bach, and, and it's, interesting, <laughs> yeah. it's interesting. You started with Bach, and you become identified with the Romantics, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no, no. I think very soon after that, I played uh, the last three Beethoven sonatas, and that it probably is my real, you know, kind of milieu. Absolutely. Well, you know, I yeah. wanted to, I wanted to uh, talk a lot about Beethoven because um, people, you know, talk about a, a, a late periods in an artist's work. 
So, you know, they'll talk about late Bergman or late Tarkovsky or, you know, late. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'll talk yeah. about, uh, you know, late Henry James. And, and but late Beethoven is, is, a, is something very special, right? Um, and it's something that you know a lot about. So, for example, the A flat opus 110. And, and, um, oh, oh, my goodness. What, yeah. So when did you first encounter the late Beethoven? And become infected into its into its glory, the glories of it. And just, oh, you know, I'm just, probably probably someone just said to me, "You ought to play that." I mean, I always do what people tell me. <laughs> they, oh, I, I like I'm always decide like, what should I do now? And a friend will say, "Oh, you should look at 110," you know, and I'll huh. do it. You know, I'll just go to it and open the music, and and that oh, then I. I was hooked, you know, oh, the, yeah. and the and the fugues and oh my goodness, and then yeah, the um, one eleven and, and one oh nine, kind of, it all you just became all them, like right? okay, yeah. Okay. But no, I haven't played all the Beethoven sonatas. Oh, okay. I'm really not a a person who wants to play all of something. Yeah. But but those three struck me as kind of almost belonging, you know, together nine, ten, and eleven. Yeah. I'm going to ask a yeah. practical question because you are so identified, sure. of course, as a chamber musician and yet also a solo doing concert solo piano. Yeah. Do you work yeah. the juggling of the work of, you know, doing solo repertoire, sonatas, concertos, and also doing <laughs> an SAN and doing a Schubert and doing. Yeah. Talk about. But all of you, this is, yeah. And, yeah. It interests me because it seems like it's very. It's a lot to juggle, right? Oh, I don't know. No, 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 no. I think, uh, well, each thing feeds into the other so well. I mean, <laughs> if I get up from playing with a violist and then I yeah. go to a concerto, I mean, it's just wonderful. You've kind of got a whole perspective that you're bringing with you, you know. And um, I think in a solo piece, too, sometimes you wind up feeling like you're an orchestra, you know, or, you know, you have so many voices at play so so much of the time. And that's why, partly why it's so great and important that we all play chamber music. Mm -hmm. You know, I think just being a soloist, Maybe it's it, you know it's perfectly fine for someone else, but for me, I think it's it's not as good as when I have chamber and mm-hmm. solo and maybe also a concerto going at the same time, and like working with a singer is invaluable. All of it, you know. I, I also a lot of this happened at different times. It's not like you know I'm 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 doing so many things. I have maybe three or four things going right now. Yeah, I guess that's what I was asking you, how you schedule that way practically, because you have to, right? Because you can't do everything at once. So is it... Is it right, the, right, the, right. The, the seasons of concerts or how do you plan? Do you plan how does that... I'm just... Um, yeah. Oh, about. gosh. Yeah, I, it's all planned out. Like, you know, although right now everything's so up in the air. I mean, I was just... I'm planning to play the uh, Mozart D minor concerto, but I know it will be postponed. I'm almost uh, positive it will be postponed yeah. because of uh, Omicron. Omicron. Yeah. 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 So things are crazy right now. Yeah. Right now, it's good. For, the best thing I've had is the recording, uh, recording possibilities, because that is doable. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you can really do that and not get into too much trouble. So going going yeah. to Montreal, you're you clearly developing chops as they, as you could say chop, <laughs> kind of kind of a chop but chops in terms of um playing with others and, and Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. What were some things that you learned about the genre of chamber music that you know yeah. kind of, that kind of changed your life that you would not have known had you not been to Marlboro? Or had that experience? Yeah. What were you learning about that kind of music making, whether it's leader, whether it's quintets, or that, whatever? Kind of yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I remember. I mean, you're making me have all these memories are coming back. But the first memory of playing any chamber music, I think, really seriously, was at um, Curtis, and I walked in, and we were doing a Mozart. Quartet, piano quartet, mm-hmm. and it, the whole thing just went through me like an electric bolt. I mean, you know, 
just to be playing with other people is so exciting, you know, and the mm-hmm. piano part, you know, at some times you're accompanying at other times you're on top and you're sort of it. You have to be very assertive. You have to lead. You have to be all these different things. You have to be following like crazy, but at the same time, other times you, it's like they have to follow you. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a a great give and take that um, there's nothing like that. Interesting. Uh, And then, well, at Marlboro, I guess I was just exposed to a lot a lot more repertoire. Plus, we had just we had the greatest coaches you can imagine, like yeah. the Guarneri, the Guarneri Quartet. Guarneri Quartet yeah. I mean, when I think back, oh yeah, the well, Guarneri I Quartet. The, I played with the Guarneri Quartet then. Um, oh, let's see. Wait, no, 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 not really. I they were coaches. Uh, I oh, I, I have played with I played with, uh, say like Raphael Hillier, who was also teaching me chamber music but right. he asked me to play with him and and things like that have happened over the years but um you know basically i've had my own um trios and and uh i've sort of created my own chamber music situations mm-hmm. and projects yeah i mean for instance i had a trio in in all all places iceland oh, for wow. 10 years with a wonderful clarinetist and cellist and we would play in Iceland we'd play a bit in Spain in the summer Mm. and then uh, a little bit in in the states as well um and that was that was you know exciting for me just that repertoire uh when you mentioned a place like Iceland and was it Italy what was the countries you mentioned that you uh just now mentioned one was Iceland uh what what is it? What is the feeling of geography or place and performance? Like when you go to a particular country, uh, we'll, we'll just stick with Iceland. Yeah. What did Iceland bring to your musicianship that was unique? <laughs> uh, oh, the- oh, gosh. Well, I mean, in one sense, really just the people, because I met several wonderful musicians there who I later played with and, and composers. So, um, I mean, I think the the people make all the difference and we were, uh, you know, nicely received, uh, as a trio. And, um, I, I went back several times and then, as I said, I, I've played with, with musicians from Iceland, Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I I, I kind of know what you're saying. It's it the whole thing changes because oh, you're in you're in this whole you're in a, a completely different situation, you know. But again, once you get on stage, it's sort of the same anywhere. I would say. Well, it's interesting. It connects to what you're saying about how all all music is united. So being in a in a playing a, a trio or a quintet is ultimately the same yeah. as doing a solo as a sonata. The principles are the same. The the, the uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And I think again, it's each one really speaks to the other. You know, mm. like after you uh, accompany a singer, you've got something that you didn't have before, and then you can bring that into your own work. You know. So it's it's interesting. What what were some uh, your first exposure or performance to modern or contemporary works that, that you either recorded or that come to your mind or uh, oh boy yeah i i would say that actually came late for me in that a lot of the music i play is, is simply the music of friends who are, who are oh, composers some some you know kind of um famous others not famous at all just people who they'll send me their works in the mail and I that, that, I know that sometimes you, i'll like it david del trinity is written for you correct yeah he did That's he right. did and uh, yeah i have a recording where there's some schubert and and then also a, a piece of uh david mm-hmm. yeah um yeah I, that came a little later i i think i was I was late in understanding the importance of it all. Now I just, oh my God, I think of being a modern composer is just just one of the most incredible and also most difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but, it certainly is. I, mean, I know there's, there's uh, I saw, saw in the media that John Adams is writing the piano concerto now. Oh, really, boy. The piano concerto um, looked interesting. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just yeah. um, composition is uh, – I was just wondering because I know it seems like you've done repertoire from all eras. Uh, well, again, I, I think, you know, I think sometimes it's good to think of yourself a little bit like an actress who can play any kind of role. You know, on the other hand, I'm sure certain things suit me better, but I like to think that I just open up a piece of music and yeah. that's it. You know, I look at what's there and do the best with it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's, you know, something I've never seen, never heard, you know, it's, it's very, um, there's, there's something very similar to opening up, say, a brand new piece and looking at 109. It's the same thing. I mean, 109 at one point was brand new, you know, and I like, I like to look at it that way. I really don't want to know, you know, what I should be thinking or doing, you know, I just want to do it from what I see. Right. Did you want to read some of your poetry or talk about that aspect? of? Oh, no. No. (laughs) I mean, no, I think, Poetry for me is just something that helps, like it's helped me get through this whole COVID oh. time. I, I wind up writing, I don't know, it's not particularly even very good poetry, but it's poetry, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, I, in fact, someone even just set my poetry. I was very uh, honored that David Post did that. He, he looked at three of my poems and he said, could I said these and I said sure gosh you know I mean I I don't think of myself as a poet I just think that and sometimes we all write poetry for different reasons Mm -hmm. and I I remember like being on a tour once and it was very a bit lonesome you know and I would just write these poems at night and it, it helped it helped me a lot just get through it you know so you see it as more, it's more, it's not a, um, a um, you don't see it as a, a career in the sense of it. Of, I, I, do, I don't, no, I don't, I have to say. No, I'm, I like to write, and sometimes it's, it's very, very um, great to just sit there and just you and the piece of paper, and, and it's very, I don't know, it, it, there's something great about it, but... I, I don't think I'm one of, you know, particularly great or anything at it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's, it's part, it's certainly connected to the other arts, certainly to music. It's interesting, it's yeah, interesting to reflect yeah. on the, the connections that are, that are there between uh, written poetic form or, or um, mm-hmm. you know, language. Um, do, you, do you compose at all? I am a composer, yes. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm yes. now, actually right now as I, as, I'm I'm working on a piano quintet, so. Um, oh my gosh! Yeah, that's kidding. Other, wow. Yeah, so I'm I'm working on both the second and third movements. So, um, that's exciting. Yeah, I'd love to write a piece for you, actually. <laughs> I'd love okay. To write a piece for you, and and the reason why is that I always write for myself. but, uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm thinking it would be interesting to really write for for another for a pianist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And kind of approach the piece from that point of view, you know, not that yeah. I'm going to be playing it, and see what happens. And also, I like the romanticism. I'm very interested in romanticism, and I, I think I, mm-hmm. I thought if I were to write a piece for you, I can really take uh, write as romantic a piece as I could possibly <laughs> summon. Right, it'd be played beautifully or be played perfectly, and I would think, oh, oh, I don't know, I don't know, but I would. Bring my best to it, that's for sure. Um, yeah, but I do compose, but I, I compose irregularly and um, when uh-huh. I can. And I also compose in mostly in pop forms. So I don't write. Right. I write right. mostly tunes and I write for my trio. But, you know, occasionally I do do classical lawn forms, like I'm doing this um, piano quintet. Mm-hmm. I have a flugelhorn concerto. I have different things, you know, that are. Oh, you know. cool. I'd love to hear that. Where can I hear that? It's never been done. Oh, okay. because the because okay. the recording for that fell through, and it's a long story. Well, that was a good one. yeah. But you know, you do what you can, and why? Sure. Do you compose music or? Oh gosh, I 
hardly at all. The only yeah. things I've ever written were songs oh, or sure. songs. So I guess I've had a just a, a smattering of of composition in my life, but you know, re- very little. <laughs> I think I have to admit, you know, the piano just, you know, that's for me is kind of where I kind of belong, I think. I love the piano. I think it's just the greatest instrument, you know, as cliche. As oh, I do that. too. I mean, it can be anything. It really can it's be anything. It's almost like the world in, a, in sand. It's yes, kind of yes, like the cosmos yes. and the piano. Yeah, it's I agree. A, I agree. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it sort of, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, um, and also when you came up, uh, the people you studied with, Curtis, and um, do you mind yeah. talking a little bit about technical details? Because there's, you know, as sure. you know, there are many schools of piano um, technique and styles of, mm-hmm. of pedagogy mm-hmm. and about what to do with fingers and arms. And right, hands. right, do right. You, speaking a little bit about that, because that's something that um, is quite complex and people have many opinions. And what, what were some of the uh, sort of... Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, I mean... It's funny for me, uh, a lot of my teachers, I think, kind of, oh, so, like, I, I was a bit of a natural, as, you know, many people are, play. Uh, but then I would say, when I, when I studied with uh, Dorothy Taubman, mm-hmm. she got the most technical of any of my teachers in terms of how to do something. I mean, you could literally ask her, how, how do I do this? You know, whereas I would never say that to Sirkin, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I would never say, how do I do that arpeggio? You know, I would just do it at the the best I could. But I mean, with Dorothy, she was so open to talking about technique on the on the other hand she i think she'd rather just talk music of course she she loved just course. Every, talk everybody, about everybody would rather just just talk but yeah. just, uh, the thing yeah. that is is i studied music in the in the 70s and 80s uh-huh. uh which was a slightly different era and i remember there was a proliferation at that time of schools of thought and there was the mm-hmm. russian school and you know the, yeah. the italian yeah. and i'm just wondering if you <laughs> have any uh it sounds like you kind of stayed out, stayed stayed away from some of that. I did. That I did. I, yeah. I did. I never really. Um, I could. I would. It would be hard to say what school, but Darcy really had a wonderful way of um, looking looking at how to play the piano. Mm. I mean, oh my God! You know, she was very incredibly helpful with anything to anything very difficult like list or yes exactly or i mean when i think i i don't think i could have even maybe i'm wrong but i i don't think i could have played some of the works that i played with her if i hadn't um you know came come up come upon her I imagine you've done Mephisto Waltz and Tone tone and Tance, right? No, 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 no. No, you know, it's funny. I'm just learning the list sonata right now, this minute. As we speak, you're tackling that piece. Yes. That's an amazing thing that I'm talking to Beth Levin. (laughs) And when she's not on my podcast, that's what she's working on. What a, what a. (laughs) <laughs> talk about that piece list and talk about it. oh my god I, I you know i barely i know that i really think it's, it, it's going to be for a recording with um pictures at an exhibition oh, wow. the two pieces and um i i think it, it's good i it's think big, um normandy <laughs> when you say that that eugene normandy recorded oh there. oh like i haven't even heard it i haven't heard it but that's i should neck of the woods right Philadelphia, Jean Normandy in Philadelphia. Uh, yes, back, yes, yes. I think that was right. the early seventies. Uh, oh boy, yeah. Now. But uh, I did. Um, I I've only played one other. List has not been one of my um, major uh, composers mm-hmm. that I've tackled. Just the Dante Sonata, the Dante oh. Sonata. But anyway, this should be. Ex- I, I'm I'm excited about these two works together. Yeah. It's a great com- winning combination, as they say. Yeah, I what think would you so. Think yeah, the listener makes list unique. I mean, in that period, what what does list bring to either composition or the piano that 
is kind of... Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I was expecting... It's funny. I was expecting it to be quite alien because, you know, I was brought up in so much Chopin and um, Beethoven, yeah. Schubert, and I just thought of it a little bit as alien, you know. But just... then I, I jumped in and... There's this, oh, wonderful contrast of sort of the devil and the angel, you know. That's right. And it's so easy to sort of relate to that from so many other um, things that you've heard. And it's, you know, not alien at all. I'm I'm very, I'm I'm a little surprised. Did you initially have that impression? Is it because he he really stood out from those, from, from the Chopin, he sort of, was he more revolutionary or more unusual at that time, would you say, or was it? I, I guess I also thought of it as maybe um, more technical, and I, okay. I, I like things when I can just sort of go straight to the musical ideas and not oh, yeah. think so much about the technical. Technic, right. But it's I, I have to say, it's not even that hard. That's another thing that it surprises me very much, that it's not, you know, like some crazy technical challenge well I, I play through the I play for fun through the Mephisto waltz both to both yeah um, to work on technique that's that's the other thing too a teacher taught me that instead of doing exercise books do the do the yeah. repertoire what right about that right. advice is to actually play pe- um, parts of works to work on technique. right um, I don't know. I think there's something to it. But anyhow, I was going in. And yeah, I think I, I go I go for that idea, basically. And also, just like if you have a great desire to do it, you'll you'll do it, mm-hmm. you know, somehow. But I'm sure I'm sure when you were coming out, there was still exercise books and scales and all. <gasps> yeah. In the very beginning, there really was. I mean, uh, my first teacher, who was a wonderful woman who came over also to go to Curtis Institute, which is funny. She came over and she was just in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. She gave me scales for one year. Oh <laughs> and I was what, like four or five. And I mm-hmm. think in looking back I was very lucky that she did that. But you know, and then of course, I think um Mr. Fullard gave us a lot of Cherny and I don't know. I mean, I had to play a lot of Cherny. It's, um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Cherny's kind of a strange composer because he's sort of writing. I feel like a lot of Cherny is like half music. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, they're like, yeah, it could be very musical. Well, but they're not fully musical. It's almost like there's somewhere between an exercise and a, and a written <laughs> composition. And it's a str- am I right about that? It's just straight. It's odd about the I'm odd about them. But I guess that's why they were designed. They were designed for I guess for pianists. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I know, like for instance, I I certainly played a a lot of um, Chopin etudes, Uh-oh, but I pref- I preferred going to the Chopin preludes. Like mm-hmm. that's what really interested me more than the etudes ever interested me. You know. I, I'm just sort of more wanting to get to the music. Well, the show you know. preludes are very are very hip. I mean, they're very um, they're uh, and the word I would use is they're very they're very um, sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, I guess I mean, you're right. Some yeah, more sophisticated than the than the skirt than the etudes. Some, some yeah, reasons. yeah, I think I'm, so. I love Chopin is great. I'm not, I'm not trying to pit Chopin against Chopin. I'm just saying, no, no, just no, of that, that, course. That, that, the, that the designation of prelude is deceptive. And that, you know, even though they are preludes, yeah. they're like sometimes like, a, yeah. they're, they're much more. They're like, they're like a little sonatas at times, you know. And, 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 oh, yeah, they, they're incredible pieces. Yeah. I considered playing them with... Um, with pictures at an exhibition, but the people who are doing the recording really wanted the list, and I just went with it. That's fine. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've played the preludes, you know, and sure. they are fantastic to play. Do you mind talking a little bit more about Chopin? So Chopin is just, again, one of these... There are certain people in the history of art that, that they come... They're like a star. Their star emerges and brights, yeah. shines. yeah. And just leaves, just changes the world forever. 
you know, and I, I sort of think, right. I actually feel like Chopin was one of those people, as was Beethoven, right? I mean, yeah, so yeah, I agree. What comes to mind when you think of Chopin? I mean, just the just output for the piano is remarkable, right? I mean, just um, Un- unbelievable. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, you know, I I try I try to read about him and thinks he's he's sad and everything, but yeah. I guess in the end, just going to the music is the thing to do. Sure. Uh, but I mean, oh, the output is incredible. Yeah. And I try I try to read about how he performed and oh. and everything, although we may never really know. But I think he was very, very sensitive. Well he was you know, did you ever see that uh movie Intermezzo with Julian Sands and the- <laughs> Yeah, I think I have seen it maybe a, a long time ago. And but Judy yeah. Davis is is uh, George is um yeah, as we're saying, yeah, and, yeah. And so, um, what did you think of that picture for what it was? I mean, was there any? How much of that was? Um, uh, oh gosh, you know, I'm pop. someone who sort of I like these, even when they're not totally accurate. Like Amadeus is not accurate, that's but a wonderful. I, I sort of I love that's it though. Film you know. That's Milos Forman and Thomas Holtz. That's a beautiful piece. Oh, film it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I was fortunate to see the Broadway. With was it Richard? Who was the original on Broadway in the seventies? Uh, was it Hulk? wow? I'm, do you might remember as a New York fellow, New Yorker? It was a play first. I'm just trying to remember who played Mozart. Um, oh, that's gosh, I don't know. Well, of course, that's a that's a you know the movie Amadeus. Of course, is about much larger concerns than the person Mozart. It's a, of course about the mm-hmm. of accomplishment and ambition and self doubt. Yeah, it's a deep play, but. But you're right. But I just getting back to the the Chopin. I mean, it's um, there aren't many representations of him in in, in media or art. And certainly, that's one. That's true. That's true. Uh, I'll have to really go back and look at that. I I I can't. Pro- I I probably shouldn't speak of it too much because I I I have to really look at that again. But you know, thinking about the Chopin, the man. Of course, you people often remark on his sensitivity or psychological. Mm-hmm. Individuality, yeah. but what's your take on what that is about? Is well, no, I mean, I think music? there's such great power there too. You know, there's such Absolutely. great power, but um, it's so n- nuanced. I mean, oh boy, just those mazurkas to get a mazurka right is mm-hmm. really something. You know, because because of the sophistication, as you were saying before. The sophistication and understanding the dance form. It's not just the harmony, it's the rhythm of the harmony. It's also rhythm. Yes, and yes, the, yes, the know, rhythm. Also what he does with um, phrasing. It's just, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, what I'm talking about. But I mean, it's, um, it's, um, yeah, so you're feeling his uniqueness when you play those, but... Um, Yes, I would say you're right. I think um, that was a great thing with Falar in that, well, for one thing, he, he's, he really, I think, understood the dance forms of yep. all of the pieces, yep. and he would show that so well in the playing. And then as a student, you would kind of, you know, uh, get that. And, and it was a, a great, um, you know, it was a great gift that he gave gave us well there's certain favorite mazurkas like the um well the a flat d minor i mean they're different um yeah yeah you know yeah just the falling the falling the the Uh, the falling so what when did you first encounter that one? The the I forget there. Oh the, gosh, uh, yeah. With with Solar, um, I mean, we would have to um, sort of have. Oh, you know, we always had these little concerts. Um, yeah. Sometimes, um, you know, it's funny. He would sometimes teach uh, out of his apartment and just kind of privately, but also at Settlement Music School in Philadelphia, which was a special place because, again, a lot of these great musicians came over after the war Absolutely. and they would, teach, they would teach at Settlement Music School. It was, it was incredible. Like, you'd walk the halls and there'd be, like, a famous violinist and, mm-hmm. you know, and they'd be schmoozing outside the door. And it, was, it was really a, a nice environment. Well, it's so fortunate that you were around the milieu of, of the Eastern European and European 
Yes, yes. You know, right. Very lucky. Because these were the yeah. people that really made major contributions, and they were in your. It sounds like they were in your neighborhood, in your backyard. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Philadelphia is a great place, uh, a great musical place to come from. Mm-hmm. It's really a fine. I mean, between settlement and then Curtis and then a string players and even even the um oh the public school system mm-hmm. then I uh, had wonderful teachers for mm-hmm. for orchestra and uh created a lot of great players. So it was a good you know, it, it was very, very, very good. When did, so you went to BU before Curtis? No, no, after, Dick after. Curtis. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I, I heard about Leonard Shore and I was very um, curious. But in a way, it was just sort of going from from Sirkin into even more, <laughs> even more intense kind of <laughs> working through Beethoven and Brahms and everything. I mean, they were both very intense teachers. When but you, you t- but intense. I mean, what right. Be- so what Beethoven did you do with? Um, let's say the first Beethoven. You're with Leonard Schur, and you. Um, oh yeah, let me think. Gosh, what was it? I don't know. Oh, I, I now I know. I know it was the Appassionata. It was the Appassionata. <laughs> you know, when you're young, you have to play that. You know, you have to bring that in. I remember, that like, says, that piece is going to la- outlast other music. <laughs> <laughs> that and the, the patatique, right? They're gonna, they're going. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, pieces are, right. are, are like are gonna right. for the ages. <laughs> I don't think they ever get yeah. old. They don't, right? They don't, they don't no, but I mean, I think that that's the challenge, though, not to you know play like a war horse, like a war, I like a war that. horse. You know, I think it's good to try to bring something fresh there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, he. Uh, I think I played some Brahms for him, and he mm-hmm. it, it wasn't even that good or anything. But he just there was something there that he he liked, and mm-hmm. he said, "Well, we're st- let's start next week." You know, it was wonderful. We had a, a nice group of pianists. We were all kind of more supportive of each other than competitive, I would say. And that was very good. Do you mind talking about that spirit or that ethic, or what was either what was unique about that, or beneficial about that, or what it, how? how oh yeah, musicianship. I'm sure there's a lot to say. I mean, I think when you go to a place like Curtis or probably Juilliard, I don't know because I, I never went to Juilliard. I went to Curtis, but uh, it's everyone sort of. Uh, there and you know that you've been chosen and it's there's a certain competition going on I think even if it's unspoken but then at Boston University was uh, was more um, relaxed I'd say it was a different kind of atmosphere and I think we uh, with maybe a couple of exceptions we were for each other we really were for each other we just wanted to try to get what Mr. Shore was there trying trying to tell us, you know. And he was not easy. He wasn't someone who told you this is what you do. Uh, He would wait until you would understand something, you know. So it was was not easy. You say it's not easy because you have to find it within yourself? (laughs) Well, you had to try to understand what he was after, which was often... Phrase like to really understand the phrasing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he would say on four measures. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started.
just the call accidentally dropped. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that okay. Tech. So, so uh, uh, you were talking about uh, um, competitiveness versus collaboration and the spirit of. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I think I've I've been in situations in both situations, and um, I, I I think it's it's very. It's very good when people around you are uh, supportive, mm. you know, of course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, other times it's good to be in in, in a competition as well mm. because other um, qualities are fostered in yourself, you know, mm. to, to have the confidence and everything to go through that. Yeah. Well, I guess it builds different aspects of character, I'd imagine. Yes, right, right. Exactly, exactly, yeah. What was the first um, time in your musical career where you played a really large concerto with a, with a grand orchestra that, really, yeah. that, that you can say, this is, a, this is kind of a big deal, this particular performance? Or, or quite, right. What comes to your mind? Was it what piece? Or just oh, kind of, well, that was uh, when I was... 13. <laughs> oh, I was that far. Okay, 13. Thir- uh, 13 with the um, 467 Mozart and again, the Philadelphia Orchestra, which was, you know, like in Philadelphia, they had these competitions for kids. Yeah. And I won that. And, and again, Mr. Falar, uh, Marianne Falar, prepared me to play um, for 467. I think, um, you know, I get there's some in a, in a concerto as well. There's that quality of chamber music, partially, mm-hmm. where you're you're kind of trying to be one with the orchestra, but then at the same time you're a soloist. So right. you know you kind of it was the first time I could really experience that that um, sensation. So thirteen. So I'm sure there's a long long journey from thirteen to. I guess thirty or twenty. Um, so I imagine uh, you would have many. No, and then the next one was when I was seventeen. A mm-hmm. similar situation, and then there were other just regular, just being hired by. You know, I I played with the Seattle Symphony and and here and there, you know, mm-hmm. over the years. But those were the fir- those were the first. I see. Uh, interesting kinds of um, beginnings as, as a concerto soloist. Do you, do you have? Would it be fair to ask if you have a favorite concerto, or you, you sort of? Ask? Oh my gosh! Well, you know, I played the Bronze D minor um, several times in my okay. career, and and that has that and the B flat has to be some of my favorites, and and Schumann A minor. I mean, oh my gosh! And Chopin E, e, e minor and F minor. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, Gosh, uh, maybe Emperor. Emperor or uh, four and five. Well, all of the Beethoven, all of the yeah. Beethoven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, let's see. Uh, Ravel, Ravel. I was just wonderful. Add, I was just, <laughs> so Ravel wrote two amazing works uh, for concertos. As mm-hmm. you know, the G is and then the left hand and... Um, Right. Just um, talk a little bit about Ravel. Love Ravel. That's a, a, an amazing work. When did you first play, perform the Ravel, Thorkin? Um, when did I perform it? Ravel, yeah. Oh, that was um, maybe, gosh, now it's maybe 20 years ago with the Reading Symphony. The The conductor is now gone. Um mm-hmm. His name was Sidney Rothstein, mm-hmm. uh, and he asked me to play Ravel. I, I mean, oh, discovering that piece was just fantastic. And I've played, um, oh gosh, uh, Gaspard de la Nuit. Uh, that, that was incredible to learn that. You know, any, any Ravel is just so uh, kind of sweeping, and yet there's a classical underpinning. You know, mm-hmm. so I think that's maybe true about so many things. Like, you can't just say it's classical or, you know, things have all these different qualities that you have to bring together. That's right. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Monroe is, is often thought of as, as a hybrid or as sort of a, um, I don't know what you call it, a, um, um, someone who is unclassifiable precisely because he combines so many mm -hmm. uh, sensibilities, not just classic mm -hmm. rigor of classicism, but also all this feeling and passion in his writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway. So what are your feelings going forward now? I know you continue to do, you have a, this project coming up. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, again, the, having the project of the uh, concerto, which would have been February 13th, but I think it's going to be pushed back. Mm -hmm. uh, but having that is, I mean, to go to that every day is, is, I don't know, heaven, I guess you'd say. That piece is so, so beautiful. And then having the um, recording project of the, um, the list and the Mussorgsky is very uh, mm -hmm. exciting. And then I'm playing with a violist these days. We're forming a duo. And you know, as long I'm like as long as these things are are kind of um, percolating along, I'm I'm happy. You know, of course. You know, it, it, I guess I if if there's even just one really really good project, I'm 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 happy. You know. I guess I have to before all good, even good things come to an end like this discussion. But I have to ask you about I guess your um, your uh, regimen if you have a daily regimen or. Are you at the piano? Oh, oh, I'm oh, oh, about that. oh, Just, God. Um, oh, well, I think for one thing, uh, I don't practice as much as I used to. I mean, yeah. there were times when I was young when I would play through the night, you know, yeah. <laughs> like hours and hours. Now, I would really say I'm like a three hour person now. I, I can't see going much more. Um, I, I like the morning the best, maybe like I, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, something like 9 to 12, yeah. and then maybe come back to it later a little bit, later in the afternoon. But that's what I do. Yeah, I mean, of course, everybody's unique, and you have to find, what, find what's right for you, of course. Yeah. And, of course, younger musicians do practice more, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was always trying to search for things so much, like yeah. at the piano. And, and my technique, I don't think, was always great. It's mm -hmm. now at a place, after, especially after Dorothy Talman, where I feel good. Like, I don't have to question a million things. But when I was yeah. young, I did, I did question everything. And it took time. I mean, it sounds to me, it sounds to me when you stop questioning, that's when it becomes part of your nervous system. Right? So that yeah. That means the piece is, is within you and you're sort of, like, uh -huh. in a way, united with the piece. And that, I guess that's what yeah. you strive for, right? I mean, I think that's sort of the, um, seems to me that's the, yeah. that's the it's, goal. At least it's, it's hovering around there somewhere. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else you want to talk about that comes to your mind, though, as, as we conclude on oh, music boy. Or, um, or literature or anything? That, um, oh, it I'm sure it should, but I'm blanking. <laughs> no, I enjoyed this very much. I have to thank you. I thank you for your generosity and time. And I know we're in, a, we're in an unusual time, a di most difficult time now, but it, yeah. it's worth, worth remembering that there's people – like yourself doing what you're doing and that that continues is, is really all, oh, yeah. the more, God. all the more important. And, um, and it's very, it's something that I, that, uh, for which I have great gratitude. And, and so, um, I look forward oh, to this getting out. Thank there. you. Thanks so much. This was, was, this was really lovely. And, uh, I hope we'll do it again sometime. And I, I I'm going to look for some of your work. Yeah, well, I am going to start writing a piece called Beth Levin. That's going to be the, on the name. All right. <laughs> probably, All right. Probably it's going to be a Fantasia. <laughs> oh, oh, even better. Even better. I love it. To be continued, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Happy New Year to you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Happy New Year. Bye.
I don't like goodbyes. So I'll see you soon, folks. Thank you. Mm-hmm.